You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hey, y'all. Spooky season is here. And if you're looking for a show to whet your appetite for a little haunted history, then I'd like to invite you to check out Southern Gothic, a chart-topping history podcast that explores some of the most infamous legends, folklore, ghost stories, and hauntings of the American South. We've covered all sorts of stuff from the Bell Witch of Tennessee to the disappearance of the Confederate submarine, the H.L. Hunley, not to mention our deep dives into the local lore of some of America's oldest and most haunted cities like New Orleans, Charleston, and St. Augustine. So if you're ready for a little good old-fashioned Halloween storytelling with a commitment to quality historical research, then be sure to check out Southern Gothic today. It's available now on all your favorite podcast apps. It was sundown, and General Jameson had given the order for our whole brigade to fall back to an entrenched position on the turnpike about a mile and a half to the rear, having the advantages of wide open fields in front on both sides of the road, where our batteries would have a good range to guard against a night attack. Somehow or other, I believe from the cowardice or other default of our courier charged with the delivery of the order, it never reached us, and after the other regiments of the brigade had gone safely back, and the enemy had followed them a considerable distance along the turnpike behind us, we still held our position on the, to the left of the road in the very front where the hottest of the battle had been. I knew well from the direction of the firing on our right that the enemy had succeeded in flanking us on that side, and there was still light enough to see fresh regiments beyond the house moving to our left. Our men had shot away all their ammunition, except perhaps one or two cartridges apiece, and had emptied besides the cartridge boxes of our dead and wounded. Captain Kirkwood, of Company B, succeeding to the command as senior captain, asked my advice as to what he should do. I told him we had done all we could for that day, that under the circumstances, to remain there longer was to expose what was left of the regiment to be sacrificed or captured, as in a few minutes the only avenue of escape left us would be cut off. We had sent back all our wounded that we could find, the dead we could not possibly take with us through the slash and swamps we would have to cross. Accordingly, the captain gave the order to fall back slowly, just as it was growing dark. After I had seen that we had left none of our men behind, we turned our men into a bypath that diverged considerably from the main road, which was held by the enemy in force, and from which they greeted us with random and harmless volleys. A little further on I was struck by a spent fragment of shell, causing a slight smart for a few minutes, but without breaking the skin. That was the only time I was even touched that day by any of the enemy's missiles. Captain Bernard J. Reed 63rd Pennsylvania, Jameson's Brigade. As we were passing along the road at Double Quick, President Jefferson Davis passed by us with his suite of attendants. Every boy snatched off his hat, and the wild rebel yell rent the air as a salute to the gallant chieftain of the Confederacy. On we dashed, and at every bound nearer, clearer, deadlier resounded the clash of arms. When we reached a little old schoolhouse on the left side of the road, we were halted. Just beyond the house, on a little mound, was General Johnston, seated upon his big gray horse, with his glasses adjusted, looking at the enemy. Turning around, I hear him ask the question, What command is this? General Hatton replied, Tennessee Brigade. Put them right in, said General Johnston. General Hatton, turning around to his men, gave the command, Load! There was a general rattle of steel as this command was repeated by the company officers down the line. When my gun was loaded, I looked. There was General Johnston's horse, but the saddle was empty. A shell had burst. Johnston was wounded. The next command from General Hatton was, Fix bayonets. Every old soldier knows what that means. It means somebody is going to get hurt. The next command was, Forward Guide Center. The three regiments were moving in perfect line. Our regiment, moving north, passed through a skirt of timber where the Yankees had been camped, and when we passed through, we were ordered to halt and lie down. 
It was now sunset, and deadly missiles and treetops were falling around us. In the dusk, I raised up on my knees to look. Across a little clearing close to another skirt of woods, I saw the Yankee lines forming. I told the boys they were coming. Soon the company officers passed along the line, commanding, Up, boys! The boys came to their feet, guns in hand, and the racket of arms began. Right in the onset, everything was enveloped in smoke and darkness. We would shoot at the flash of the enemy guns, and I suppose they would shoot at the flash of ours. Amid the din and clatter of arms, the boom and thunder of cannon, both sides gave way. It was said that we were engaged three minutes. I know I fired my gun only three times, and I was as calm and deliberate and busy as I could be. Private Henry T. Childs, 1st Tennessee, Hatton's Brigade. Thanks for downloading episode number 137 of our Civil War podcast. I'm Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello, y'all. Welcome to the podcast. With the last show, we started to look at the action on the first day of the Battle of Fair Oaks. With this episode, we'll finish up with day one of the battle, and then we'll see what happens on the second day. As you guys will recall, the Confederate offensive kicked off on Saturday, May 31st, 1862, But on that first day of the battle, little went as the rebel commander, Joseph E. Johnston, had planned. He had hoped to hit the Yankees south of the Chickahominy with a major three-pronged assault that would overwhelm the enemy force before they could receive help from the rest of the Federal Army, which was over on the north side of the rain-swollen river. But Johnston entrusted James Longstreet with tactical command of the battle, and Longstreet obviously badly misunderstood Johnston's plan, because on Saturday morning, Longstreet's force took the wrong road to the front, and so right from the get-go, Joe Johnston's plan started to fall apart, as Longstreet's blunder meant the three-pronged assault was reduced to two. Longstreet's error, though, caused further complications, as his errant division blocked the path of Benjamin Huger's troops. This caused the Confederate attack to get a late start, since Huger reaching a predetermined position on the rebel right flank was the key to launching the initial assault. Besides causing Huger's movement to be delayed, Longstreet's vague orders to Huger effectively removed that division from the fight. It wasn't until about 1 p.m. that D.H. Hill, in the center, learned that Huger's lead brigade, at last, had come into position to the south. Hill immediately launched his assault down the Williamsburg Road, but the Confederate attack was starting five hours behind schedule. Hill's men swarmed forward and pushed back the enemy division commanded by Silas Casey. The Confederates broke through Casey's main defensive line, which was anchored by an unfinished earthen work grandly known as Casey's Redoubt, and then the rebels overran Casey's camps. They surged forward, but ran into steadily stiffening resistance as the Federals put together a second defensive line at the Seven Pines Crossroads, where the battered remnants of Casey's force were bolstered by Darius Couch's division and two brigades of Phil Kearney's division. While D.H. Hill's division struggled to maintain its momentum, Hill sent urgent pleas for help to Longstreet. But Longstreet, who remained in the rear, was still confused about the battle plan and had misdirected four of his six brigades, and so he had only his two remaining brigades to send to assist Hill. One of those brigades was led by James Kemper, while the other was commanded by Richard Anderson. Colonel Micah Jenkins took two of Anderson's regiments and went on a blitzkrieg through the Union line, slicing through the Federal center in one of the boldest and most daring attacks of the war. Not long before dusk, Jenkins had cut his way through the Federal defenders and, amazingly, reached a point half a mile east of Seven Pines, that is, in the enemy rear. The Confederate assault by this point had pushed the Yankees back over two miles, and Jenkins' Blitzkrieg had cracked open the Union line. But all of this had been accomplished by only six of the 
23 brigades that Joe Johnston had intended to participate in the attack. Up until this point, D.H. Hill had pretty much shouldered the burden of the fight himself, with late assistance from two of Longstreet's brigades. There's no denying that Longstreet had badly bungled the management of the battle up to this point, but even more troubling than Longstreet's bungling was Joe Johnston's puzzling inactivity throughout most of the day. While the Confederate plan of attack fell apart right from the get-go, and while D.H. Hill's division battled forward virtually alone, Joe Johnston remained at his headquarters and made hardly any effort to take charge of the situation. To some degree, Johnston's behavior can be blamed on a rare natural phenomenon known as an acoustic shadow. An acoustic shadow occurs when factors such as wind direction and terrain affect the travel of sound waves. The result is that sounds, even loud ones, cannot be heard by someone in a spot fairly close to the source, or the sounds might be heard but they're muffled or muted, while someone a considerable distance away can hear them clearly. Acoustic shadows played a part in several Civil War battles, and there's no doubt that one was at work here at the Battle of Fair Oaks. As fighting raged just to the south, the only sound that Johnston could distinguish at his headquarters was muffled cannon fire, leading the Confederate commander to assume that an artillery duel was being fought and the main attack hadn't yet begun. Robert E. Lee rode to Johnston's headquarters and said he had heard heavy musket fire, indicating a large-scale engagement was occurring, but Joe Johnston dismissed the notion. There's no question that an acoustic shadow at Fair Oaks played a role in the Confederate commander's ignorance about the true state of affairs throughout most of the day. But the truth is that, even given the acoustic shadow, Joe Johnston waited much too long to take an active role in the battle and to try to make take charge of the situation. It wasn't until shortly after 4 p.m., when he received Longstreet's request for support from the left, that Johnston finally realized what was happening and finally bestirred himself and left his headquarters. The Confederate commander decided to lead Whiting's division into the attack himself and guide those 10,000 fresh troops down the nine-mile road toward the Union right flank. And just a reminder, but this is precisely the attack down the Nine Mile Road toward the Federal right flank that Longstreet was supposed to have made earlier. But of course, that attack was never made, owing to Longstreet's bungling. So now, late in the day, Joe Johnston was moving down the Nine Mile Road himself. Exactly. At any rate, as he went forward with Whiting's division, Johnston didn't know that Micah Jenkins' bold thrust through the enemy line had already achieved a great success. But nevertheless, if Johnston could now crush the Federal's right flank, when coupled with Jenkins' success, then a complete Confederate victory might yet be salvaged from the botched battle plan. But, as we said at the end of the last episode, in a day filled with unhappy accidents for Joe Johnston, yet another frustration lay ahead on the Nine Mile Road. Rushing forward at last to save the battle, Joe Johnston led Whiting's division down the Nine Mile Road to Fair Oaks shortly before 5 p.m. and found the place deserted, which was the first encouraging sign the Confederate commander had seen all day. Now the Seven Pines Crossroads was only a mile away, and while Johnston wasn't sure of the situation there, he had at his disposal 10,000 fresh troops with which to deliver a decisive blow. But Whiting suspected that Fair Oaks wasn't as deserted as it seemed. He told Johnston that he had a hunch the Yankees were nearby in some strength to the Confederate left and rear, out in the impenetrable wilderness toward the Chickahominy, where no Federal forces were supposed to be. But Joe Johnston had the bit between his teeth, and was impatient with such a notion. The Confederate commander replied testily, "'Oh, General Whiting, you are too cautious.' And at that moment, shells began to burst around them, fired from Union artillery about 800 yards to the northeast, that is, to the Confederate left and rear. 
The Federals, which were actually four regiments of infantry and a battery of six guns, were fragments of Darius Couch's division. About an hour earlier, Micah Jenkins' attack had cut them off, Couch included from the rest of the division. They made several attempts to fight their way back to the new 3rd Federal Defensive Line east of Seven Pines, but Couch gave it up as suicidal after two of his regimental commanders were killed. Couch was leading that isolated fragment of his command up a path toward the Chickahominy when he spied rebels, Whiting's division, out on the Nine Mile Road, moving south. Undetected by the enemy, Couch hastily established a line of battle on either side of the building known as the Adams House. Thus posted on a rise facing west and commanding a marshy meadow that opened toward Fair Oaks, Couch ordered Battery H of the 1st Pennsylvania Light Artillery, commanded by Captain James Brady, to commence firing on the unsuspecting Confederates. Whiting responded quickly, sending four regiments charging across the clearing towards the Adams House. But Brady's 10-pounder Parrot guns repulsed them once, then again, but the 3rd Rebel charge pressed forward and threatened to overrun the Federal battery. To his dismay, Brady found that he'd run out of canister, and in desperation he ordered his guns to fire shells with the fuses cut as short as possible so that they'd explode almost immediately after leaving the cannon's barrels. The advancing Confederates came within 20 yards of the Federal gun line, but then they were stopped again by the enemy shells exploding at point-blank range. Nevertheless, Whiting's division so far outnumbered Couch's handful of men that the Federals would have soon been overwhelmed had it not been for a remarkable turn of events. A long stream of blue-clad reinforcements suddenly appeared from an unexpected quarter from across the flooded Chickahominy. Their arrival shortly after 5 p.m. was the culmination of a daring trek that had begun some four hours before. You see, when the sounds of battle to the south had first reached the federal headquarters at Gaines Mill on the north side of the river, George McClellan, who was bedridden with malaria, sent an alert to 2nd Corps Commander Edwin Sumner. Little Mac's message merely warned Sumner to be ready to move across the river toward Seven Pines, but the old general who had bungled at Williamsburg was taking no chances here. He immediately marched his two divisions out of camp and down to the nearest couple of temporary bridges that had been recently constructed over the Chickahominy. Then, when the order to move actually came from McClellan about 2.30 that afternoon, Sumner was ready to cross the river immediately. But cross on what? Cross on what? That was the question, since the Chickahominy was on the rampage. The river was still rising from the previous day's severe storm. As Sumner's Second Corps moved down to the river, the flooring of one bridge was under two feet of water. A single brigade managed to wade across, but then the span collapsed. A mile and a half downstream, the other span, called Grapevine Bridge by the troops, looked hopeless as well. Jostled by the rising waters, the rope that bound the log flooring had chafed apart and gaps now separated the logs. In the middle of the span, the flooring threatened to float away at any moment. As Sumner rode up to the Grapevine Bridge, an engineer officer told him it would be impossible to cross. In reply, Sumner thundered, Impossible? Sir, I tell you, I can cross. I am ordered. The men of Brigadier General John Sedgwick's 2nd Division cautiously advanced onto the span. The bridge swayed, but then the weight of the troops and their horse-drawn artillery actually worked to settle the flooring back in place. The going, however, was harder on the far side of the bridge, where the logs used to corduroy the approach now drifted uselessly in the floodwaters, and so the troops and artillery had to slog through a marsh 200 yards wide before reaching firmer ground on the south side of the river. The guns mired axle-deep and had to be unhitched from the struggling horses, and then the cannon were wrestled free and pushed and dragged forward by mud-covered infantrymen. Undeterred, Old Sumner bowled ahead toward the sound of the fighting. Two hours later, he led his troops up to Couch's beleaguered regiments beside the Adams House. At the sight of the reinforcements, Couch felt, as he later wrote, that, quote, God was with us and victory was ours. 
The vanguard of Sumner's column, three of Sedgwick's brigades comprising about 8,000 men, strengthened Couch's north-south oriented defensive line, then established a second line perpendicular to it. This new line, facing south, extended west into the woods above the clearing. Thus situated, the Federals were capable of pouring a heavy crossfire on any rebels who came into their field of fire. Joe Johnston on the Nine Mile Road didn't yet realize that he was now facing an enemy force equal in size to his own. The Confederate commander still thought that he had to deal only with an isolated band of troublesome Yankees before he would forge on to help Longstreet at Seven Pines. So Johnston ordered Whiting to send in three brigades to renew the attack against the Federals over by the Adams House. Advancing across the meadow without artillery support, the Confederate troops took another severe pounding from the Federal guns. To Brady's six cannon had been added five 12-pounder Napoleons of Battery I, 1st United States Artillery, commanded by a 22-year-old first lieutenant named Edmund Kirby. The 11 Union field pieces poured out a steady stream of shot and shell. During the engagement, Brady and Kirby would bombard the rebels with no fewer than 500 rounds. Some Confederates gallantly charged and managed to get within 15 yards of the Federal cannon before their attack was literally blown apart. Other rebel soldiers entered the woods and blundered about there, caught in the devastating crossfire of musketry. Two of the three Confederate brigade commanders went down. Brigadier General Robert Hatton, formerly a congressman from Tennessee, was killed instantly as he led his troops forward. Brigadier General James Pettigrew, a wealthy South Carolinian, was shot in the chest, left for dead, and later captured. Brigadier General Wade Hampton, a 44-year-old South Carolinian who was one of the wealthiest men in the South, was hit in the foot, but insisted on staying on his horse, directing his troops, while a surgeon removed the bullet. As the surgeon was dismounting to perform the operation, his own horse was shot from under him. Toward dusk, Joe Johnston finally realized what he was up against at Bear Oaks and reluctantly concluded that the battle would have to continue the next day. At about 7 o'clock, he was observing the fighting from a knoll 200 yards north of Fair Oaks and well within range of the Yankee guns across the way. In his excellent book, To the Gates of Richmond, Stephen Sears describes what happened next. Quote, One of the young staff officers with him instinctively ducked whenever a bullet sang past, but Johnston, a veteran of hostile fire in the old army and five times wounded by it, laughed and told him, Colonel, there's no use of dodging. When you hear them, they have passed. A moment later, the general was struck in the right shoulder shoulder by a bullet, and a moment after that, a shell exploded directly in front of him, and a large fragment slammed into his chest with force enough to knock him off his horse. Sears' account continues, quote, His staff carried him up the nine-mile road to a sheltered spot and, st- and sought out stretcher bearers. Johnston regained consciousness just as President Davis arrived to commiserate with him. No doubt the president was as shocked as Johnston by the turn of events. This was the second time in two months that the Confederacy had witnessed an army commander struck down in the midst of battle, and Davis could only hope that this time the wound was not mortal, as had been the case with Albert Sidney Johnston at Shiloh back in April. In To the Gates of Richmond, Sears writes of how, after he regained consciousness, quote, Johnston discovered that his brace of pistols and his sword, which his father had carried in the Revolution, were not with him. He asked if someone would go back for them, expressing particular concern for the sword. I would not lose it for $10,000, he said. One of his couriers, Drury L. Armstead, raced back to the scene of the wounding, now under increasing enemy fire, and managed to retrieve both the pistols and the sword. In gratitude, the general presented young Armistead with one of the pistols. Stretcher bearers then bore him in great pain back to his headquarters, and later that night he was carried to Richmond. His wounds were not fatal, but they were serious enough that he required six months to recover.
General Johnston and his staff rode back about 200 yards to an elevated position, which he occupied until he was wounded. The fire of artillery and musketry in our front was terrific. I, being in a few yards of where General Johnston sat on his horse, dismounted and stood with my horse before me. I had an oilcloth strapped on the front of my saddle, directly in front of my breast. The mini balls were flying so very thick, I thought I would stoop a little behind my horse. When as I stooped, a bullet tore through the oilcloth, just missing the top of my head. About this time, fresh troops going into battle stopped to load their muskets near where I stood, and double-quick towards the enemy. During this time, the battle was raging with great fury all along the line. Most of General Johnston's staff, having been sent off on duty, except myself and the colonel, and the air seeming to be alive with whizzing bullets and bursting shells, the colonel would move his head from side to side, as if trying to dodge them. General Johnston turned toward him and, smiling, said, "'Colonel, there's no use dodging. When you hear them, they have passed.' Just after saying this, a shell exploded immediately in his front, striking the general from his horse, severely wounded and unconscious. I immediately sprang forward, catching him up in my arms, carried him out of the enemy's fire. Others coming to my assistance, we moved him back about a quarter of a mile, and laying him down, hastily sent for a stretcher. He then regained consciousness, and finding that he had lost his sword and pistols, said, the sword was the one worn by my father in the old Revolutionary War, and I would not lose it for ten thousand dollars. Will not someone please go back and get it and the pistols for me? And several others and myself volunteered. On returning to the battlefield, we found our line had been considerably pressed back, and the spot where General Johnston fell to be midway between the line of battle, which was blazing in all its fury, with men falling all around like leaves. I dashed through our line to the spot where the general had fallen, snatched up the sword and pistols, jumped upon my horse, and was making my way back to our lines, when I hadn't got more than twenty yards when one of the pistols fell out of my hand. I quickly sprang to the ground, picked it up, when just as I did, a discharge of grape from a battery of artillery planted within a hundred and fifty yards from where I was, tore up the earth all around me, but I leaped upon my horse and reached our lines in safety, where I met one of the men who had volunteered to go back for the sword and pistols. He demanded me to turn them over to him. I said, No, I will take them to the general myself. He replied, I am your superior officer. I have the right to order you. I said, Superior officer or not, you will not get this sword and these pistols unless you are a better man than I am and I don't think you are. Private Drury L. Armistead, Staff, General Joseph E. Johnston. With Johnston out of action, the fallen general's second-in-command, Gustavus Smith, took over. The 41-year-old Kentucky-born Smith was a large-framed, handsome man, a West Point graduate, and a veteran of the Mexican-American War, where he had earned two brevets. He had then been a rising star in the pre-war U.S. Army until he resigned his commission in 1854 to take up a career as a civil engineer. He was serving as street commissioner of New York City when the war broke out, and although being a pro-Southern Democrat, he didn't offer his services to the Confederacy until September 1861. When Smith took over the battlefield that Saturday night, he faced mixed prospects. The advance of Whiting's division had petered out in a bloody stalemate at Fair Oaks. Farther south, however, the Confederates appeared to have the upper hand, D.H. Hill, with the help of those two brigades from Longstreet, had driven the Federals back some two and a half miles, back past the Seven Pines Crossroads, where the Yankees had cobbled together their third defensive line of the day. But at every point, the Federal positions were growing stronger. Sedgwick's division extended from the Chickahominy southward to Fair Oaks, and a division under Israel Richardson, arriving from the north side of the river, deployed along the railroad tracks from Fair Oaks eastward nearly a mile. At that point, the Union line turned south perpendicular to the Williamsburg Road. 
Here it consisted of Phil Kearney's and Joe Hooker's divisions, with the remnants of Couch's and Casey's battered divisions in reserve. By dawn on Sunday morning, the Federals' line south of the Chickahominy was strong enough to swing the balance of power in their favor, reversing the situation of the first day of the battle. Saturday evening, as darkness descended over the battlefield, exhausted soldiers of both sides slumped to the ground and slept on their arms, whether in marsh or field or woods. A soldier in the 15th Massachusetts of Sedgwick's division later recalled how, quote, It was a night of drizzling rain and inky darkness. All were wet to the hips. Many had lost their shoes in the mud, and the bodies of the dead and wounded were lying on every side. You could not move without falling over them. The air was filled with shrieks and moans. It was also an unnerving night for Gustavus Smith, who was not only exhausted like the troops, but apparently stunned by the sudden weight of responsibility suddenly thrust upon him. Shortly after Joe Johnston was carried from the field, Jefferson Davis had asked Smith what his plans were for continuing the battle, and Smith had replied that he had none. He might have to withdraw, he said, or perhaps he might be able to hold on to the ground that had been won that day. Then Smith spent most of the night trying to decide what to do, and probably sensing correctly that his previous uninspiring answers had disappointed Jefferson Davis. Smith finally selected a third alternative. The army would continue the attack on Sunday. In the early morning hours of June 1st, Smith summoned Longstreet and presented a scheme that bore the troubling signs of hasty planning and muddled thinking. While Whiting's division would merely stand fast and pin down the enemy troops to its front, Longstreet would take the entire right wing of the army, his own division, plus Hill's and Duget's, and wheel northward from their positions to the south and attack cross-country toward the railroad east of Fair Oaks. But Longstreet was distinctly unenthusiastic about Smith's plan, He knew that Federal resistance had been steadily stiffening throughout Saturday's fighting, and perhaps assumed that any continuation of the Confederate attack on Sunday would be futile and serve only to waste lives. He certainly was aware that the terrain over which Smith expected the men to pass was roadless, nearly impenetrable marshy woodland, almost impossible ground which would cause formations to break apart and lose cohesion as they tried to advance. To Smith, Longstreet voiced another concern. If the entire right wing of the army wheeled northward, then the Confederates' right flank would be laid bare and terribly vulnerable to a Federal counterattack westward along the Williamsburg Road. But in response to Longstreet's fears, Smith declared that the Federals east of the Seven Pines Crossroads were in no condition to mount such an attack, and then he tried to reassure Longstreet by offering to call on the divisions of Magruder and A.P. Hill if they were needed. You guys will recall that Magruder and A.P. Hill had spent the first day of the battle guarding the upper reaches of the Chickahominy. Right. But despite Smith's attempts to win him over, Longstreet remained cold to the battle plan. Longstreet, in fact, resisted the scheme so stubbornly that Smith finally had to give him a direct order to launch the three-division attack. When Longstreet rode off at 3 a.m. on Sunday morning, he was still grumbling but apparently compliant. James Longstreet, however, had no intention of obeying Smith's orders. His doubts about the battle plan aside, he had no respect for Gustavus Smith's leadership and no confidence that the Army's new commander would actually support his, Longstreet's, attack once it started. And so Longstreet went to see D.H. Hill, who had set up his headquarters in the captured enemy camp in the bullet-riddled tent abandoned by Silas Casey. There, Longstreet merely told Hill to dispatch a few brigades to, quote-unquote, develop the enemy's front, that is, to probe the federal defenses to determine the size and strength of their forces. Longstreet's instructions to D.H. Hill were obviously a far cry from the full-blown three-division assault that Smith envisioned for the second day of the battle. As dawn broke on Sunday morning, June 1st, 1862, 
Gustavus Smith was roused from a few hours' fitful sleep and handed a message from Robert E. Lee. Lee's message read, quote, It will be a glorious thing if you gain a complete victory. Our success on the whole yesterday was good, but not complete. It can't be determined how much faith the exhausted and rattled Smith actually had in his battle plan for Sunday. In his state of mind, whether or not he had much confidence in a Confederate victory of any degree can be debated. But had he known of Longstreet's willful insubordination, Gustavus Smith would have had even less confidence that he'd be able to deliver the complete victory that Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee hoped for. History never says goodbye. It just says, see you later. Edward Galliano was right when he said that. Events keep happening over and over again in some form. And that's the reason I produce the podcast, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. What is it? We take stories of history and apply them to the events of today to help you perhaps understand them better. We are also part of Airwave Media Network. I've been doing the program since 2006. That's a long time, and the show has a long name. My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. Find me wherever you get podcasts. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics, we go back to source materials in their original languages, and we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer, or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast. Wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. The Yankees fell back and Armistead advanced us into a worse thicket, halted us, and said, Prepare to charge. I saw nothing to charge and thought him loony. The colonel said, Fix bayonets, and we did. The general said, Lie down, and then ready, and we cocked our rifles. Then he said, Now men, even if the Yankees step on you, don't a man shoot till I say fire. There was a sapling down in front of me, which made a good rest, so I knelt. I happened to look back and saw the brush shaking about fifty yards behind us. It turned out to be our other regiments coming in. On turning back to the front, the brush was shaking there. Soon we saw their bayonets, then their heads. They must have been fresh troops, for their skirmishers were not more than fifteen or twenty feet in front of their line, and they were peeping back to where the brush was shaking behind us, as if they were hunting turkeys. As they were about to step into us, Armistead yelled, Fire! The whole line disappeared, and I do not think many of them fired, as we lost only one or two killed and five or six wounded. The man in my rear put his gun just beside my face and fired, blacking my face, burning it slightly, and deafening me, and a ball struck me on the outside on the right knee and stopped about an inch above the ankle. It felt as if something heavy had fallen on it. I looked and saw a small hole in the only new uniform I got during the war. As it did not hurt, I started to reload, but got sick, and the captain told two men to take me off the field. They put me in a blanket, as we had no ambulance corps, took me back to the road, and put me in one of our regimental wagons. The driver took me to Richmond, about seven miles in a gallop, which came about as near killing me as the wound. Private Drury B. Easley, 14th Virginia, Armistead's Brigade. At this point, the railroad ran through a piece of woods, 
and we, though facing occasional bullets from the enemy, could see but a short distance ahead of us. While in this place waiting further orders, Colonel Barlow himself went forward into the woods to learn more of the situation. From the stray bullets coming over some of our men were hit. It came to the mind of one, or a few ingenious men in the ranks, that a recumbent posture would conduce to safety, and he or they at once took it. This hint was taken up by others, and in a very short time every man was flat on his belly. Presently the colonel appeared, and perhaps looked twice for his regiment he had left standing. He at once roared out, Who ordered you to lie down? Get up at once! And every man was on his feet. Then the order came, Forward! Guide center! March! And we entered the woods. At this point the timber was quite heavy. There was considerable small growth, and underfoot it was swampy. It was impossible to maintain a good line. In such an advance the naturally courageous will press forward, and the naturally timid will hang back, and the officers and file closers have their hands full to urge up the laggards. In my place as orderly, I was directly behind Lieutenant William H. McIntyre, commanding my company. Next to me, to the left, was Corporal Willie, an old friend from my town. As we were working our way to the front, he spoke to me and said, Charlie, am I hurt much? I looked up and saw the blood running down the side of his face, and that a part of his ear had been shot away. No, nothing but a part of your ear is gone, and we pressed forward. Soon we came upon the 52nd New York, I think of French's brigade, lying on the ground in line of battle. I suppose they had exhausted their ammunition and were waiting for our appearance. We passed over them and advanced a few rods when the order was given to halt. Then strenuous efforts were made by our, our officers to get the men up in the ranks and address the line. While this was going on, no firing was had on either side. I did not see a rebel, and did not think one was within musket shot. Lieutenant McIntyre stood in the captain's place, and I immediately behind him in the place of the first sergeant. Suddenly a tremendous volley was fired by the enemy at a short range, which was very destructive. McIntyre sank down with a deathly pallor on his countenance. He said, I'm killed. I stooped down and said, Lieutenant, do you think you are mortally wounded? He replied, Yes, tell them I'm killed. He never spoke again. Sergeant Charles A. Fuller, 61st New York, Howard's Brigade. At first light, D.H. Hill sent two of Longstreet's brigades, under Brigadier Generals Cadmus Wilcox and Roger Pryor, out on the Williamsburg Road to relieve Micah Jenkins and to block any Federal counterattack westward. Then he detached three brigades, one of Longstreet's under George Pickett and two of Uget's commanded by Louis Armistead and William Mahone, and sent them north through the heavy woods toward the rail line. D.H. Hill seemed as reluctant as Longstreet to engage the Federals on Sunday. His instructions to the brigade commanders were vague and incomplete. For example, to Mahone, he merely said, Take your brigade in there, and gestured toward the north. Hill neglected, moreover, to tell any of the three brigade commanders of the other's involvement in the advance. Consequently, each thought he was attacking alone, and so gave no thought to maintaining flank contact with the other two, which was a dangerous tactical flaw that the Federals would exploit fully. At 6.30 a.m., Mahone's troops and those of Armistead to the right collided with the Federal Brigade led by William H. French, the vanguard of Israel Richardson's division, which was deployed along the railroad tracks. French was a stocky, florid-faced West Pointer who had the habit of blinking uncontrollably when he was excited, and his men called him Old Blink Eye. He had just ordered three of his four regiments into the thick woods south of the tracks to feel out the Confederates. Without warning, a volley crashed into the Federals from 50 yards away, and they came rushing back. The din of musketry quickly grew deafening. An officer of the 57th New York recalled, Quote, the firing rolled in long, continuous volume, 
now slackening, now increasing, until it seemed as if pandemonium had broken loose and all the guns in the world were going off at once. End quote. As French's troops took cover on the north side of the tracks, their excited commander supplied a touch of comic relief by tumbling into a hole filled with muddy water. An alarmed captain shouted, The general will be drowned! The absurdity of old Blink-Eye drowning in a muddy hole while the air was filled with flying bullets drew a roar of nervous laughter from the ranks, and it turned out that French was more embarrassed than harmed. A nearby officer remembered that, quote, His face grew redder than ever. He was pulled out, covered with mud, and mad as a March hare. French nevertheless succeeded in stabilizing his line, and then he called for help from Brigadier General Oliver Otis Howard, whose brigade was deployed behind the railroad tracks as the second line of Richardson's division. Howard, a pious New Englander who had distinguished himself at First Manassas, immediately sent the 81st Pennsylvania under Colonel James Miller across the tracks and into the woods on French's far left to prevent a Confederate flank attack. As the Pennsylvanians advanced, Miller detected activity ahead in the trees and then saw the shadowy outlines of soldiers formed for battle. He quickly deployed his regiment and barked out, Ready? Aim? But before he could complete the command, one of his subordinates yelled, Colonel, they are our own men! And Miller quickly ordered his troops to recover arms. As his men lowered their muskets, Miller called out to the strangers, Who are you? The answer came from a hundred throats, Virginians! They were from Lewis Armistead's brigade, and they instantly unleashed a murderous close-range volley that killed Miller and killed and wounded scores of his men. The 81st broke and skedaddled back toward the railroad with the Virginians in hot pursuit. At the sight of his men fleeing from the enemy, Howard sent 22 year, his 22-year-old aide, First Lieutenant Nelson A. Miles, riding full tilt to rally them. Miles galloped through enemy fire that wounded his horse and grazed his ankle, but he managed to turn the panicked Pennsylvanians around and soon had them firing back at their tormentors. For this display of gallantry, he was promoted to the rank of lieutenant colonel after the battle. Howard then personally led the 61st and 64th New York through French's men and into the teeth of the Confederate fire. As he rode over the railroad tracks, his horse was shot from under him, and he remounted a large gray commandeered by his aide and brother, First Lieutenant Charles Howard. The distinctive gray, however, must have made the general an even more conspicuous target, for soon Howard was hit twice in quick succession, first in the right forearm and then in the elbow of the same arm. At almost the same instant, the gray was hit and fell beneath him. In pain and in shock, Howard was led from the field by his brother, who was himself hit in the thigh minutes later. Howard lost his right arm, a loss he suffered with composure and even humor. When Phil Kearney, who had lost his left arm years before in Mexico, consoled him, saying, I am sorry, General, but you must not mind it. The ladies will not think the less of you. Howard managed to laugh and replied, There is one thing we can do, General. We can buy our gloves together. Meanwhile, back on the battlefield, the men of the 64th New York were shaken and confused by the loss of their brigade commander. They slowed and then stopped their advance, while to their right, the troops of the 61st New York pushed on resolutely into the teeth of the Confederate fire. The 61st New York was commanded by a 26-year-old colonel named Francis Barlow, a Harvard graduate and lawyer who was known for his toughness and temper. He added to that reputation as he led his men over the tracks and through French's line. When some of his troops sprawled flat and hugged the ground in an attempt to escape the enemy fire, Barlow roared, Who ordered you to lie down? Get up at once! Then Barlow saw a group of terrified men crouching in some bushes and pointed them out to his troops as, quote, examples of what a coward is, end quote. Pushing forward through the thickets, Barlow came almost face to face with the Confederates of Mahone's brigade, and the fighting rose to a fever pitch. Barlow reported, The singing of the ball was awful. Men were dying and groaning and running about with faces shot and arms shot, and it was an awful sight. 
Despite the carnage, Barlow and his men kept up their attack and edged forward. And for all their grit and fighting spirit, the Confederates under Mahone and Armistead gradually lost the upper hand. Mahone, a scrappy little man who weighed only 95 pounds, ordered repeated assaults on Richardson's positions, but his tactics were faulty. Instead of attacking with a concentrated blow, he committed his three regiments piecemeal, and each was chewed up in turn by the blue-clad defenders. The 3rd Alabama was the first to charge, and its commander, Colonel Tennant Lomax, was shot dead, and the troops floundered about leaderless. In the chaos in front of the railroad tracks, the 175 of the Alabamans were killed or wounded, and the fleeing survivors threw a scare into the next regiment to advance, the 12th Virginia. The 12th was repulsed, as was the 41st Virginia after it. Finally, Mahone's brigade retreated all the way back to the main Confederate line along the Williamsburg Road. D.H. Hill, watching the retreat, was furious. He later blamed the Confederate failures on Sunday entirely on Mahone. On Mahone's right, Armistead's troops found the poor visibility in the dark woods at first a blessing and then a curse. It had enabled the Virginians to surprise and drive off the hapless 81st Pennsylvania. But later, as the fight grew hotter, the Confederates also found that it was impossible to tell friend from foe. The 14th Virginia, mistaking troops to its front for the enemy, fired on the 53rd Virginia, throwing that regiment into confusion. At about the same time, Armistead's men began to pay the price for D.H. Hill's indifferent preparation for the day's advance. Armistead made no attempt to maintain contact with the brigade to his right, Pickett's, because he didn't know it was there and Pickett had advanced with great deliberation so that he lagged far behind Armistead. As a result, a wide gap yawned between the two Confederate brigades, each of which thus had a flank exposed dangerously to the Federals. Federal artillery and infantry began pouring fire into the gap between Armistead's and Pickett's brigades. The barrage came from one of Kearney's brigades that had been deployed just down the tracks on the left of Richardson's division. Its commander, Colonel J.H. Hobart Ward, had encountered no significant Confederate opposition to his front, so he sidled along the tracks toward the sounds of battle and ran right into Armistead's unprotected right flank. From the cover of the railroad cut, the Federals poured deadly, enfilading fire into Armistead's troops. Sensing his advantage, Colonel Ward shouted, Fire! Charge! And give them the bayonet! and with a cheer the Federals leaped from cover and stormed Armistead's vulnerable flank. The rebels crumbled before the onslaught and fled for the rear. Ward, triumphant, quickly broke off the pursuit of the beaten foe and marched his men back to the railroad tracks. In the meantime, Pickett still hadn't closed with the Yankees, and he was astonished to hear the sound of battle out beyond his left flank. He rode off to investigate, and to his surprise and dismay found scores of Armistead's routed men streaming toward the rear. Pickett rode farther until he found Armistead and a group of other officers trying in vain to restore order. The two generals hastily conferred and then sent couriers galloping southward to ask for reinforcements from D.H. Hill. But no reinforcements came, for reasons Armistead and Pickett wouldn't learn until later— and so, fearing a powerful Union drive on their weakened position, the two brigadiers decided to pull back. As they withdrew, Israel Richardson sent forward his third line, Thomas Mars' Irish Brigade. No Confederate commander seemed willing that morning to invest additional troops in what now bore all the signs of being a failed offensive. Earlier in the day, Longstreet had sent messages repeatedly to Gustavus Smith demanding that Smith commit Whiting's division to the attack. But Smith must have realized that Longstreet wasn't committed to carrying out his orders, that there wasn't a three-division assault rolling forward, and, bewildered by what was happening, Smith hesitated to assert control over the battle, and finally did nothing at all. D.H. Hill, for his part, had asked for reinforcements from Longstreet, but Longstreet chose not to respond. Having disapproved of the battle plan from the start, once the action got underway, Longstreet was content to stand by and let events run their course. 
D.H. Hill, after realizing that he would be given no support, decided to call off the attack, and about 1 p.m. he issued orders for his scattered brigades to pull back to the area around his headquarters, west of Seven Pines. Guarding the Williamsburg Road to the east, Pryor and Wilcox were stunned when they got the orders to withdraw. All morning long, their brigades had easily turned back attacks by Joe Hooker's division, and as Wilcox later wrote, quote, The men were eager for the fight, and everything seemed to indicate a success as full and complete as the day previous, end quote. But Pryor and Wilcox nevertheless obeyed the order to fall back. As the Confederates fell back, Hooker seized the opportunity to send two of his brigades forward in a sweeping charge. At the same time, Colonel Ward, near the railroad, sent one of his regiments, the 40th New York, charging south. The New Yorkers came on like a lightning bolt and sliced into the flank of Pryor's retreating Confederates. Led by a hot-tempered Irishman, Colonel Thomas Egan, five companies of the 40th slashed through the rebels all the way to the Williamsburg Road, losing 96 of 231 men in the process. Every man of their color guard was killed or wounded. The regimental flag ended up in the hands of Corporal Robert Greaves, who was severely wounded in the shoulder. Greaves nevertheless carried the flag until the 40th New York's charge was over. Then he defiantly plunged the staff into the soft soil of the peninsula as the Confederates in the distance continued their retreat. Soon afterward, around 2 p.m., the firing sputtered to an inconclusive close. The battle was over. It had been a vicious battle, the biggest and bloodiest thus far waged in the war's eastern theater. The Confederates, who called the engagement Seven Pines after the place of their success, suffered just over 6,100 casualties, including 980 dead. The Federals, on the other hand, named the battle Fair Oaks, since that was the spot on the battlefield where they met with success. During the fighting, they had incurred just over 5,000 casualties, of whom 790 were killed. On both sides, the rank-and-file soldiers had fought well, but what was most striking was the failure of command. McClellan spent the battle in bed and offered little leadership other than to send Sumner over the river to aid the two threatened corps. On the Confederate side, the most glaring failure was the ineffective command presence of Johnston and Longstreet. By choosing to remain rooted at his headquarters during most of the day on Saturday, Joe Johnston lacked the situational awareness necessary to influence the battle, and actual command therefore fell to Longstreet. Johnston knew as early as 9 a.m. that something was wrong, and yet rather than ride out to personally seek an explanation and possibly salvage his offensive, he chose to remain at his HQ, where, as one historian points out, he remained, quote, wrapped within a cocoon of ignorance and bad luck. The most significant event of the first day occurred not on the confused and indecisive battlefield, but back at Johnston's headquarters when, after spending most of the day too far away to effectively understand the battle, Joe Johnston then decided to move too close. And then after Johnston's wounding, Gustavus Smith quickly proved that he was simply not up to the burden of high command, and two days after the battle he left the army, his nerve shattered. By dawn of Monday, June 2nd, the Confederates had withdrawn to the lines that existed before the fighting began with their backs against Richmond. Nor did the battle alter the Federal situation much, except that Sumner's Corps was now south of the Chickahominy instead of north of it. Really, the only significant change after the bloodletting at the Battle of Fair Oaks was that the Rebel Army defending Richmond now had a new commander. With Joe Johnston seriously wounded, and Gustavus Smith having suffered a breakdown, Jefferson Davis, in this moment of crisis, announced that the Army's new commander would be his trusted military advisor, Robert E. Lee. The challenge facing Lee was immense. Not only was he taking over in the aftermath of a wretchedly mishandled battle with the enemy still within a few miles of Richmond, but the Army had displayed considerable devotion to Joe Johnston 
and greeted the news that Lee was taking command with less than overwhelming enthusiasm. Longstreet wrote of how, quote, The assignment of General Lee to command the Army of Northern Virginia was far from reconciling the troops to the loss of our beloved chief, Joseph E. Johnston, with whom the Army had been closely connected since its earliest life. All hearts had learned to lean upon him with confidence and to love him dearly. General Lee's experience in active field work was limited to the West Virginia campaign, which was not successful. There were, therefore, some misgivings as to the power and skill for field service of the new commander. End quote. The fact that from this inauspicious beginning, the army, by the end of the summer, was willing to follow Lee blindfolded is a tremendous testimony to Lee's leadership and undoubtedly one of his greatest accomplishments. Across the way, McClellan didn't immediately learn that Johnston had been wounded and wouldn't discover until around June 10th that Lee had assumed command of the rebel army. Had he known earlier, however, he likely would not have been concerned, for when he did learn of the change in enemy command, Little Mac told Abraham Lincoln, quote, I prefer Lee to Johnston. McClellan went on to explain that this was because Lee was, quote, too cautious and weak under grave responsibility, wanting in moral firmness when pressed by heavy responsibility, and likely to be timid and irresolute in action. Little Mac even remarked a short time later that, quote, Lee will never venture upon a bold movement on a large scale, end quote. We share all of this, of course, to show that rarely has a commander so badly misjudged his opponent. At any rate, as we start to wrap things up for this show, we wanted to let you guys know that this is where we'll leave the Peninsula Campaign for a while, because with the next episode, we're heading out to the Shenandoah Valley, and we'll spend quite a bit of time looking at Stonewall Jackson's famous Valley Campaign, which, as we've already said, had a considerable impact on events in front of Richmond by drawing off Union forces. Union forces that had originally been destined to join McClellan in his assault on the Confederate capital. Only after we cover the Valley Campaign in its entirety will we then return to Robert E. Lee and Little Mac and watch as Lee, far from being timid and irresolute in action, as McClellan predicted, Instead, Robert E. Lee boldly takes the offensive and saves Richmond in a series of ferocious, bloody engagements known as the Seven Days Battles. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. And our recommendation this time is Smithsonian Civil War, Inside the National Collection, Edited by Neil Kagan and Stephen G. Heislop. This is a beautiful and well-written coffee table book that you could um, get yourself as a belated Christmas gift. Um, this book was just released a couple of years ago to commemorate the Civil War's 150th anniversary. And from among tens of thousands of Civil War objects in the Smithsonian's collections, curators handpicked 550 items and then use those items to construct a unique narrative that begins before the war and goes through Reconstruction. Uh, the items are arranged into groupings by specific topic, with each of these groupings introduced by brief essays. As soon as you open this book, you'll get sucked in, and you'll want to sit and page through the entire thing, so don't say we didn't warn you. You can find Smithsonian Civil War, inside the National Collection, and all of our other book recommendations if you head over to the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. As we wrap up the show, we want to be sure to thank some of you for your generous donations to the podcast recently. Thank you to Elmar B. in the Netherlands, Stephen C. in Pennsylvania, Ben H. in Virginia, and Andy S. in California. And besides his donation, Andy also signed up for the Strawfoot Brigade, along with Luke and Adam, who also joined recently. So we're glad to have you gentlemen on board. Hope you enjoy the members' episodes. 
And then we're grateful, as always, to Spiritwood Music for their permission to use their song, Midnight on the Water, as the music you hear at the beginning and end of every episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. Rich and I do hope you'll join us again next time as we leave the peninsula for a while and head out to the Shenandoah Valley. But until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.